Okay, let's open our Bibles again to the book of Matthew, chapter 1. Matthew 1. And we'll continue reading the last uh, four verses here today, but let's read verses 22 and 23 as we get underway. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. By the prophet, verse 22, is Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14. If you, any of you want to turn over there for a moment, you can. The Revised Standard Version, 1952, copyright the National Council of Churches, rendered that verse, a young woman shall conceive. Uh, some versions say a maiden shall conceive. Well, young women conceive all the time. There's nothing miraculous about that. That a young woman would conceive um, would hardly be a miraculous sign. God said in Isaiah 7, 14, <clears throat> Therefore the Lord himself shall give thee a sign to the nation of Israel. Uh, but then the modern translators suggest that Joseph was Christ's father. Luke 2, verse 33. I mentioned this during our preaching time. Uh, his father and mother marvel at those things which were spoken him by Simeon, Simeon in the temple. So even though Matthew 1.23 says virgin, the liberal unsaved skeptic, skeptic mentality uh, can say, well, she was still a virgin until she and Joseph came together. After that, she was a young woman who conceived. See how they do it? See how it's done? Uh, years ago, there was an unsaved liberal modernist minister named Harry Emerson Fosdick back in uh, New York City. He was supposedly a Baptist, but not like any Baptist I've ever known or want to associate with. He didn't believe the Bible literally. He didn't believe that the Jews had any claim to the Holy Land. And he once said he didn't know a single intelligent Christian minister who believed in the virgin birth. Well, if the virgin birth is dismissed, then the very deity of Christ has to be dismissed as well. The Hebrew word, Alma, A-L-M-A-H, spelled in English, means virgin. Everywhere it occurs in the Old Testament, for example, Genesis 24, verse 43, Eleazar prayed, when the virgin cometh forth to draw water from the well, and so forth. Song of Solomon 1, verse 3. As ointment poured forth, therefore do the virgins love thee. Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 8. There are virgins without number. They changed it here, or there in Isaiah 7, 14, because it was in their way. That translation by the King James translators a virgin shall conceive, didn't fit with their plans that uh, man is the measure of all things. The story of Mary only being a young woman or a maiden, as some translations say, originated in the Babylonian Talmud for obvious reasons, to deny that Jesus was the Messiah of Israel. Let me read a quote by another Baptist minister who also had some doctrinal problems. While I most certainly believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, I do not find anywhere in the New Testament that this particular belief is necessary for personal salvation." Unquote. Any author can quote his own, no, I didn't tell you who that was, did I? That was Billy Graham in a publication called The United Church Observer, July the 1st, 1966. Any author can quote from his own book, and he can paraphrase from his own book, but he'll tell you what he intended to say, what he meant to say when he wrote what he wrote. 
And if the Holy Spirit inspired uh, the Old Testament, just like we believe he inspired the New Testament, then he can quote from himself here in Matthew chapter 1. And he meant to say virgin. Verse 24 in our text, Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. We've mentioned this before. The word wife has two primary meanings. Number one, the woman that you are physical and intimate with. And secondly, the one you've made some public promise or some pro a public declaration to. And everybody knows that you're pledging yourself to her. Joseph evidently had done the second, but not yet the first with Mary. So she was regarded as his wife even before they had husband and wife relations. Verse 25, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. The phrase, knew her not, is going to match Mary's own words. If you want to look forward at Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, and uh, Luke 1, verses 33 and 34. I'll give you a second to find that. Luke 1, verses 33 and 34. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Her, the crude joke is that um, he knew her in the biblical sense. Wink, wink. How many have ever heard that phrase? Certainly. Um, and the phrase here, knew her not, also matches verse 18, if you look back there, before they came together. So the physical act between a husband and wife is what's being discussed, is being considered. And the words, her firstborn son, are also objected to by Roman Catholicism. Those words suggest, or they imply, that, Christ, that Mary had other children after Christ, which we believe she did. Go forward to Matthew 13. Matthew, Matthew chapter 13 And let's read verses 54 through 58. Matthew 13, verses 54 through 58. And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished, and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren, James? and Joseph, and Simon, and Judas, and his sisters, plural. Are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they, his brothers and sisters, were offended in him. For Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Look back at Matthew 12. Back a page. Matthew 12, verses 46 through 50. Matthew 12, 46 through 50. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. The Catholic apologist and uh, the Catholic position is that these weren't his flesh and blood brothers, sisters, but these were simply his cousins, as one Jesuit commentator uh, just uh, su suggested. These were simply cousins. Sometimes uh, it's like the use of the word son. 
Uh, it's not a direct immediate relationship, but it could be several generations afterwards. And the um, Song of Solomon refers to uh, my sister, my beloved, not his flesh and blood sister, but the woman he's in love with. And so the Bible uses terms, uh, uh, familial terms like that in multiple ways. And say so they suggest that something like that is going on here, that these weren't really his flesh and blood brothers and sisters. They were simply distant relatives or cousins. Well, we could say that if they weren't really his brothers and sisters, then that really wasn't his mother either. It's in the same context. I mean, if you're going to press your interpretation so far, don't stop there. Go all the way. But uh, taking the scriptures as they read, Christ would have been the eldest of at least seven boys and girls. Five boys and at least two girls in that household. He was the oldest. Look forward, if you will, at John chapter 2. John chapter 2. And John chapter 2, notice there, verses 16 and 17. And said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. They saw those words being fulfilled in Christ's actions and in Christ's words. But that comes from Psalm 69. Go back, if you will, to the book of Psalms. Psalm 69. Psalm 69, notice there the text that quote comes from. Psalm 69, verse 9. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproached thee are fallen upon me. Clearly they saw that fulfilled in Christ. But look at verse 8 here. I am become a stranger unto my brethren, and an alien unto my mother's children. What do you mean Mary didn't have other children? Of course she did. Mary certainly did have other children. Go forward, if you will, to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians 1. Notice there verse 19. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. Didn't say the Lord's cousin, the Lord's brother. And back to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, it says there in verse, after Christ appeared, verse five, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, verse 7. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. Well, the apostles are the apostles, but why is James singled out here? This is James, the brother of the Lord, Galatians 1.19. He appeared to James because the Bible says his brothers and sisters were offended in him. Neither did his brethren believe on him. Let's move on in our study, Matthew chapter 1, and uh, we'll, we'll tiptoe into uh, chapter 2 this morning. Verse 1, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. When Jesus was born, verse 1 says, this indicates the time near his birth, not the exact date. Look forward here in chapter 1 or chapter 2 at verses 8 through 12. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, 
bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was, not the babe. Verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, not the manger, they saw the young child, not the babe, with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. When they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Look at verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. And Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, verse 8, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. They were nearby. And verses 15 and 16. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. So the shepherds went to the manger, but Christ was approaching two years old by the time the wise men came from the east. And the Greek word here for wise or wise men is magi, M-A-G-I. Most of you have heard that in some Christmas carol or seen it written. And um, it's a Greek word. It, it, by derivation, we have the word magician in English. And is attached to the name Rab Mag, R-A-B dash M-A-G, a prince of Babylon. That name is mentioned in Jeremiah 39 verse 13. And by extension, it's the root of our words mega magnum. Means something very great. Uh, and it's a safe assumption that these wise men came from as far away as Babylon when they came. And the, the movement from uh, east to west is a biblical pattern. It's very significant for us today. Nearly all movements in this direction from east to west are good ones in the Word of God. When God drove Adam and Eve out, He drove them to the east of Eden. Genesis 3 verse 24. When Cain uh, left God's presence, he went out to the east of Eden. Genesis 4 verse 16. When Jacob fled from Esau, his brother, fear, afraid for his life after having uh, tricked their father out of the birthright, he went eastward to Paddan Aram, Genesis 28, verse 10. When the Jews were carried away captive, they were taken eastward to Babylon. The book of uh, Jeremiah, chapter 52, is an example. When David fled from Absalom, his own son, wanting to usurp the kingdom and kill his father, 2 Samuel 6, chapter 16 through 18, David fled eastward. West to east, rather west to east, is the direction of the earth in opposition to that of the sun. Notice how carefully I worded that, so the, none of you heliocentric or geocentric uh, people watching on YouTube will get offended one way or the other. However, when God called Abraham to his possession, he called him to go westward to the land of promise, Genesis 12, verses 1 through 6. When Jacob got right with the Lord, 
uh, and came home after now accumulating two wives and a whole bunch of kids, he traveled westward back to his home, Genesis 32 through chapter 35. When the Jews entered into the promised land after Moses and then Joshua, they entered from the east side to the west across the Jordan River there in the book of Numbers. When the Jews returned from Babylon, they went west. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah. We're studying that on a Wednesday night. God forbade the gospel to go east to Asia, but he did call it and cause it to go westward to Europe by the Apostle Paul. Acts chapter 16, verses uh, I think 1 through 6, long, or 6 through 10, long in there. East to west is the direction of the sun opposite the earth. And the sun is said to be a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, he's called the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness. Malachi 4, verse 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 tells us, Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's not God's love of you. It's your love of God. If you're too attached to the world, if you're too preoccupied and consumed and absorbed by the pastimes of the world, the entertainment of the world, the music of the world, the friends of the world, the distractions of the world, the hobbies of the world, the sports of the world, everything else, then the love of God is not in you. You love the world more than you love him. And you spend more time uh, satisfying your wants and indulging yourself in those activities than you do in the things of God. You can't spend 20 hours a week doing some pastime, going to some group, some hobby, uh, some playing some sport, whatever the, the hobby might be, the activity might be, and then only a couple hours a week reading the Bible or at church. The contrast is starkly revealed. It's very clear at that point. You love the world and the things of the world more than you love God. There's no way of getting around it. You can't say, well, I know I only spend a couple of hours, but it's quality time. with God. No. If you spend the quantity, the quality takes care of itself. But you can't think that, well, I watched a really inspiring video of somebody uh, on the internet and I really like that, that church, I really like the music and the preaching, um, but uh, gosh, I didn't have time to get ready to go to church myself, but I, 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 I'm running, running late for my football practice, so I'm running late for the... Don't treat God that way. Don't let the things of the world uh, consume you and be the driving force, the driving passion in you over your love for the Lord Jesus Christ and the word of God. These wise men certainly came from the east, and that movement eastward to westward seems to be the direction God took the gospel. Asia, the European, uh, the, rather Europe, European Isles, the British Isles, Greek Isles, and so forth. And then from there, over time, it moved westward to the Western Hemisphere, the United States, Canada, Mexico, South America, and uh, beyond that, it circled back around now. The action is taking place uh, in Korea and China and uh, the Middle East and the, and the uh, Near East, the land of Palestine, the land of Israel, once again. All eyes are fixed on the day-to-day -day activities of Israel, the state of Israel, and what are the Jews going to do? And... Uh, it's a miracle that the Jew has survived for 2,000 years. I know that the God of the Bible exists because the people of the Bible still exist. There's no better uh, comparison than that. The people of the Bible still exist, and forces have tried to wipe them out and destroy them from the face of the earth, wipe them right off the landscape of history, and yet all of those forces come and go. They fall and they falter and they dwindle in, in history. But the Jew 
survives. The Jew continues. That is one of the greatest miracles you and I watch taking place right before our eyes, that the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are in the land God gave them, and uh, not just the land of Israel today, the land that God gave Abraham, made a promise to him, extends far beyond the state of Israel today. And they're going to get that land uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back as the rightful king of Israel and the rest of the world by extension. I'm glad I know him. Aren't you glad you know him? Um, it should be an exciting time for us to live as believers, as Bible believers. Not just, you know, thanking, thanking God for our salvation, but thanking God that we see things on the page of the scriptures that indicate to us things the rest of the world knows nothing about. Things that other churches have no clue about what they mean or how to talk about them, how to describe them. You listen to the average radio minister or minister on the internet and uh, they want to spiritualize and allegorize everything. Everything's a figurative. Everything's symbolic. Everything represents the new birth. Everything represents a sinner getting saved, and they don't get beyond salvation. If the Holy Spirit comes into you at the moment of your conversion, and he's said to be the earnest of our expectation, the down payment, then God plans to give you a whole lot more. Uh, and if you are diligent in his Bible you'll learn a whole lot more. But you have to take the Bible literally and say God said what he meant and it's my job to rightly divide the word of truth, see what applies to me, what applied to Israel, what will apply to Israel in the future and uh, go from there.